Imagine you go to five interview stages and nail all the technical interviews just to fail in the last interview because you don't know how to center a simple div. Today, we will answer the top most asked CSS interview questions. You will also find out just how much CSS should a JavaScript developer learn, a simple trick you can apply right now to solve any CSS interview question you get, and the number one mistake developers make when answering CSS interview questions. Now, why is learning CSS so frustrating for JavaScript developers? Well, CSS is hard because most developers think it's easy. You see, when learning a proper programming language, like JavaScript or Java, you expect it to be hard. You have to learn loops, variables, and functions. But CSS is very easy to start with, which is why developers never put the time and effort into understanding how it works. They confuse easy with simple. The first thing you want to do before your next CSS interview question, it's a mindset shift. Yes, CSS is simple, but it's not easy. Now let's move on with the first CSS interview question. Agden, are you ready? Yes, let's go. Awesome. First question is, what is critical CSS? Critical CSS is the minimum CSS we need in order to render a first view of the web page when the user lands on it. And so basically it's everything you need to display that, that first uh, thing they see. And it's extremely important when it comes to web performance, you want to extract only the critical CSS and load only that CSS because in big applications, if you were to load and render and parse all the CSS, you will end up having a very uh, slow application and um, your core web vitals, as they call them, they would, they would basically suffer. Now, how can we extract that critical CSS in a normal JavaScript application? Let's say I have a React app and I want to make sure that the critical CSS is extracted and in its proper way. Uh, so the way you extract that is you can use plugins for your module bundler that will actually render the page for a specific viewport. You basically can specify the resolution and then we'll try to calculate using browser tooling. They usually use Puppeteer under the hood um, and they'll try to calculate what is your CSS coverage, basically which CSS is actually being used and they will extract that in a separate file um, and then the module bundler would be able to load only that one file, then render the whole page and then load the rest of the CSS. The reason we do this is because CSS is a global namespace. Browsers were built to really load all the CSS that you specify in your head tag, all those links before they proceed with the rendering. So as we like to say is that CSS is render blocking. That's why we want to load as little as possible in that initial uh, page render. Awesome. And by module bundler, I guess you mean Webpack or the Webpack config, right? Where we can specify that. Exactly. Awesome. Okay. Well, now let's move on with question number two. How do we create a mobile responsive layout without, without using media queries? So if we cannot use media queries, it means we cannot really specify different CSS properties for different widths. So we will probably have to find a way to tell the browser to calculate sizes itself. The way you could go about it, it's probably, I would start with Flexbox or Grid. Oh, basically, Flex would allow you to float elements for many different uh, device sizes without having to specify that. That would be number one. I would probably try to use RAM and all the other relative sizing units for sizes of fonts and elements. Don't use pixels as a specification for sizes. Uh, so that would be number two. And I think with that, you should be already uh, pretty well set. Yeah, with these two things. Of course, I think there's one or two more things we could do with the images where we can specify the max width so they would fill up the space and so on. But these two things. So basically using flex or grid and then using relative sizing for our um, element. Very nice, Bogdan. Now we're going to move on with question number three. This is one of the most asked CSS questions, and that is what are pseudo elements in CSS and what are pseudo selectors? If you could provide an example as we explain these things, it would be amazing. Pseudo elements are basically uh, different elements that you can use in CSS to select, for example, the last part of a um, element or for example if we're talking about a paragraph the first letter of that paragraph or the first line so you would basically specify those with a double column 
um, and you are able to add content to it or to highlight it. So they're very good if you want to, for example, make the first letter of a paragraph bigger than the rest. Right? That's one of the things you can use it for or highlight a specific part of a paragraph. You could use a pseudo element. And then for the pseudo selectors, I guess you are referring probably to pseudo classes, which are just the ones we can use to, for example, change the color of something when we hover with the mouse on top of it. So hover, it's one of them. Active, it's another one of them, but there's a couple of them. Okay, Bogdan, next question. I sent you a code snippet. Could you just pull that up on the screen? Excellent. So I want you to translate the following selector to plain English. Yes, you're referring to this one. Uh, so I would say this would be select. We are selecting a P. Okay, so we're selecting a P element. Right? And we have, a, we have an attribute. It's data type attribute attribute highlight uh oh but this is not equal this is a matching selector so i think this is probably starts with or contains so i would say it's probably starting with so we select a p element with data type with a data type attribute that starts with highlight and it must be inside of a section so inside of a section that is a child of an element with class article. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me give you this really quick class article. Can you okay, let me see. Bit, just for us to, to get the full picture on the screen. Yeah. Um, so yes, so basically it's it's a P element that will have an attribute data type that starts, must start with highlight. So it could be like highlight minus something, but it has to start with highlight. Mm -hmm. it, it is inside section, but it doesn't have to be a direct child. So if we'd have this, I guess it would be a direct child, but it, has, it just has to be like at some point, one of the parents of this P should be a section. But in the case of the section, there has to be the parent needs to have the class dot article. And this brings me to the main mistake developers make when learning CSS is that they get too distracted by media queries and so the elements and all these fancy words instead of focusing on the fundamentals first. By simply getting a good understanding of the box model and of CSS specificity and selectors, just like Bogdan did, you will be able to solve most CSS problems you face. And you can learn about both in the part one of this video, which you can see right now at the top of the screen. Now, now even if you know these things, CSS might still be tricky. That's because in CSS, hundreds of properties interact with each other. Just like Bogdan said, CSS is a global language, which means it can be a bit hard to predict what happens. A rule of thumb to get unstuck in those situations is to never be more explicit than you need to be. Writing good CSS code means leveraging what's already there instead of overriding it. For example, use percentages instead of media queries, or use mean width instead of width. And now on to CSS interview question number four. How would you create a dark theme for a website using only CSS? Could you demo that for me quickly? Sure. So I created one of those before using JavaScript. If I only had to use CSS, I'd probably go for custom CSS variables that are supported now um, in most browsers. So, and I guess most of the theming we can do with a bunch of colors, which would be color and background color. So we can use a pseudo class, like the ones we discussed before, which would be root. And this will basically create a sort of a wrapper around our CSS and provide it, provide those variables globally. So in any CSS, in this file now we can use these variables and i would probably declare um let's say this would be our main color um and in this case would be red and then um you can have like a secondary color and let's say this is blue mm -hmm. and basically right now in the web page i would just use this everywhere so i see there's an h1 i'm just trying to style this h1 we see and for the h1 let's say the color would be like the main color so we can use var which is a css function and provide the name of the variable and ta-da, now it's good. And then the only thing we would need to do to switch theme would be to either link this to um, the browser default theme, which sometimes relies on the operating system of the user, and then give the user the opportunity to change this. But probably they, we need a bit of JavaScript to just manipulate the DOM and change the value of those variables. Following up on that, how are CSS variables different from variables in CSS preprocessors like SAS or less? Um, the biggest difference would probably would probably be that you can change CSS variables 
and they are they actually uh, present at runtime versus SAS and less, which are present at build time. So in SAS or less, whatever we specify a variable, once we compile our SAS files to CSS, that variable disappears and it basically gets replaced with the actual value. So those variables don't exist at the runtime. But when it comes to custom variables in CSS, they're always there. And that's why we're able to switch team um, whenever the user does something, rather than we wouldn't probably be able to do that with SAS unless we'll actually have to use classes or something else to have this change in the variable value. Yeah, so those variables are not real variables, actually, because they are being injected. And once they're injected, they're actually not variables anymore, right? Exactly. Amazing, Bogdan. Uh, final CSS interview question of this series. Can you explain how CSS in JS works under the hood? Um, sure. So CSS in JS is basically a tool that allows us to write CSS styles in JavaScript files. And the magic there happens with the module bundler that will pick up those styles and create unique class names based on those styles. So basically it appeared because we were having all these issues with, for example, class names. You're building a button, let's say, and you create a class button red and somebody else in your team, uh, it's using the same class name for a totally different component. You'd end up having all those conflicts and it will be hard to figure them out because everybody it's kind of working on their own components. We try to have components as isolated pieces of code, but CSS is a global namespace. So whenever we were trying to add the selectors there, we will somehow couple our components. We defeat the whole isolation and reusability idea. So with CSS in JS, for CSS classes get a unique name based on the hash, which as far as I know, Webpack generates based on the file name where you are. So you basically make sure it's always unique. And that guarantees the fact that the CSS you write for your specific file, it's really specific and scoped to your file and you won't affect any of the other CSS classes in the project. Is there any other advantage of, how, of using CSS in JS? Well, the other big advantage I see is the fact that you can have very quickly dynamic styles. So because you have these styles now in the JavaScript file, we can always use variables to compute new styles and you can very easily add interactivity. So when somebody clicks a button, you can make things kind of change colors very easily. It used to be a bit harder when you had your CSS in a CSS file, you had to look up in the CSS file and then code something in JavaScript. And then you have all, the, all those dependencies all over the place because there'll be JavaScript code that you need to read. And then you need to read the CSS file to see what these two things do together. Whereas now you can do everything in your single component. Um, okay, Mark Bogdan, now two things I would like to know. It's number one, um, you know, is there any library that you recommend, that you work with, that you have experience with working with CSS in JS? And, and number two, cool. I mean, it seems like CSS in JS has a lot of advantages, the scope isolation, the dynamic styling. Um, but what are some of the disadvantages uh, when, when choosing to use CSS in JS? So for question number one, I used pretty much all the time style components. Uh, it was one of the main libraries that broke CSS in JS to React. There's many libraries out there, but style components was one of the easiest and I would say the most popular one. And number two, when it comes to disadvantages, probably one of the biggest disadvantages in the beginning used to be debugging. Again, because you have all these unique hashes as CSS classes that get injected at uh, build time, it's not so easy when you look at your DOM and you're like generated uh, document object, you generated HTML by, based on your JSX. It's not so easy to understand which was the CSS class that you need to change. Uh, however, in style components, you can now actually have a mix of a hash and the original CSS class name you gave. So that makes things a little, a little easier. And of course, because you pre-process all this in your module bundler, you also add a bit more work for the module bundler to do when it builds the project. The other disadvantage, and you need to be, uh, you need a special setup here, it's when we do server-side rendering because the styles we render on the server have to match the styles on the client. So somehow you want to really do this CSS injection once on the server and make sure whenever we render on the client, we reuse that same style sheet. Because if you run the algorithm again, it will maybe generate a different hash and then your styles won't match. Yeah, that's what makes SSI is so complicated, right? Now you have the state that has to match for the rendering, then you're adding CSS and then you realize, oh, mm, <laughs> actually maybe uh, we weren't made to serve, to, to render on the on the server first. Maybe, you know, we are doing things, back, things backwards. But that's a question for another video. Now, for the people watching us, in order to properly understand CS in JS, you also need a solid understanding of JavaScript first, module bundlers, and of course, Webpack.
which is exactly what we talk about in this next video. With that being said, thank you for watching. If you're interviewing right now, check the description of this video. We have a bunch of resources, including a free technical assessment for you to find out your gaps and better prepare for your next tech interview. And we will see you in the next one.